Hello and welcome to a GCSE History Revision tutorial. We're going to look at superpower relations and we'll be looking at two examples of opposition to Soviet control. The Hungarian Uprising in 1956 and events in Czechoslovakia in 1968. So let's put our two events in the context of the Soviet Union's control of Eastern Europe after the Second World War. Now this control was quickly established by Stalin after 1945. Across Eastern Europe, satellite states were established. These were communist regimes loyal to Moscow, put in place with Stalin's approval and control. Secondly, Cominform, which was a communist information bureau, which um, shared useful political information across the communist world. So this made sure that there was consistency of message and that Moscow could control and contain any thinking that it didn't approve of. And thirdly, Comic-Con, which was an economic union organised for the Soviet Union's benefit, which made sure that resources were organised and distributed at Moscow's approval across the communist world. So this gave economic domination. After Stalin's death in 1953, with Soviet control firmly established, Nikita Khrushchev oversaw a period of relative calm. Now it's in this period that our first event is going to be cited. You can see there the Hungarian uprising is in 1956. Now this quickly followed the establishment of the Warsaw Pact, which is a communist defensive alliance. It's their equivalent of NATO, and this was a collective defense agreement. So all communist states signed up to this and it made sure that Moscow could dominate militarily. You can see that at the end of Khrushchev's period in office, we have two crises that also affected relations with America. We've got the building of the Berlin Wall and the Cuba Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. And in Brezhnev's period of office, which starts in 1964, that's when we have our second event that we're going to look at. We've got the Prague Spring there, and that leads to wider revolutionary attempts in Czechoslovakia. Let's look firstly at the Hungarian uprising and put it in its context. So Hungary had been under communist rule since 1947. It was one of those Eastern European countries brought under direct um, intervention and influence of Moscow. And it had been ruled for a number of years by a Stalinist dictator, Machas Rakosi. And Rakosi's regime was incredibly repressive. There was a brutal secret police force, the AVH. Political purges took place. People were put in prison for falling foul of the regime. And there was strict control and a lack of personal freedoms. And this was coupled with economic problems. As, the other, as with the other Eastern European economies, Hungary's um, economy was organised for the Soviet Union's benefit. So there were low living standards. And in the years preceding the uprising, there was a sustained period of political instability, where the regime was increasingly unpopular and faced direct opposition from the population. We'll look at that political instability in more detail now. So Hungary was ruled by Rakosi as a dictator until 1953. He was loyal to the Stalinist regime and this proved to be his undoing. When Stalin died, Rakosi fell from favour with Moscow and he was replaced by a more reformist figure in the party, Imre Nagy. And Nagy was still a communist and he started a programme of limited reforms. But he also, because of those reforms, fell foul of what was um, deemed appropriate by Moscow and he lasted until 1955. And when he fell out of favour, Rakosi returned. Again, all of this is with Moscow's backing. There's intervention all the way through this from Moscow. 
So Rokosi returned, but he again was increasingly unpopular. So in July 1956, he was replaced with his ally, another hardliner called Erno Gero. Let's look in more detail at the wider causes of the Hungarian uprising now. So Nikita Khrushchev had denounced Stalin. He'd started a program of de-Stalinization. In particular, the brutality of the regime was criticised. So this led to a belief across Europe that Khrushchev would be more accepting of reform and that there was a possibility that change might be accepted. And secondly, the Hungarian government was deeply unpopular and had been for several years. And particularly, this is because the conservatives had returned, the hardline rulers had returned. The government was unstable. Part of the government's unpopularity and instability was its economic failures. Living standards had fallen and reform programmes had failed to deliver the improvements in living standards that the Hungarian people wanted. And they were also well aware that previous protests that had recently taken place in Poland had secured some concessions, some reforms from Moscow. So it seemed that there would be a chance that an uprising might work. So you put all of these ingredients together and we have our uprising. So let's look in detail at what actually happened in Hungary in 1956. Now the action really centres on the capital city of Budapest, where young Hungarians, particularly the student population, started mass demonstrations and disobedience against the government. And in this climate, Imre Nagy returned to power and he immediately started a programme of reforms. Now this was tolerated by Moscow at first, and Khrushchev resisted pressure from other Soviet leaders to intervene but there were two in particular that pushed him over the edge. Firstly, was a statement that Hungary would leave the Warsaw Pact, that was the Communist Military Alliance, and secondly, that one party rule would end, that opposition political parties would be allowed. And it was this that really pushed Khrushchev towards direct intervention. And Soviet tanks that had been waiting at the border rolled into Hungary there was bitter fighting, lots of deaths, but eventually, and fairly rapidly, order was returned with overwhelming force on the Soviet side. And communist control was re-established. So let's look at the consequences of these events. First we'll look at relations between the superpowers. So Khrushchev's militaristic actions destroyed any trust that had been building between the Soviet Union and the USA. And the de-Stalinisation moves really didn't count for much. Secondly, Eastern Europe, and in particular Soviet conduct in the satellite states that they'd formed, became a focus for tension. Events in Berlin soon followed this. And thirdly, after America failed to intervene in Hungary, and we'll look at that in a moment, the USA was determined not to appear weak over Eastern Europe again. And this also fed in to their determination not to back down in later conflicts centred around Berlin. So if we look at consequences for the Soviet Union, in the short term, there's a political gain. Because of the firm action that Khrushchev took, there was a reduced risk of other satellite states rebelling. It also increased Nikita Khrushchev's security as the leader of the Soviet Union, both internally and also as leader of the communist world. He'd shown his authority, he'd shown that he could be a strong leader, just as Stalin had. And this also showed to the satellite states and also again within the Soviet Union, just how far de-Stalinisation would be carried forward, what the limits of that would be. 
that firm control and firm rule would be enforced and that one message would also be carried forward. Secondly, results for the USA. This really underlines the policy of containment that they would put up with communism in certain places in the world. They wouldn't attempt to roll it back. They wouldn't attempt to push communism out where it had already been established. So it would be contained rather than rolled back. The USA had also shown what the limits of its influence would be. They wouldn't interfere behind the Iron Curtain. And thirdly, the USA had looked quite weak in this whole process, with no assistance being given to the rebels, which was partly a result of its allies being distracted and divided over the Suez conflict. Britain and France were involved in conflict in Egypt at this point, and this really distracted the, uh, the Western world and its attention while events in Hungary took place. Lastly, consequences for Hungary itself. Well, a hardline regime that lasted for a long time was quickly re-established. It's a huge human cost too, nearly 20,000 dead. Imre Nagy himself was later taken out of the country and executed. And Hungary is placed under hardline communist rule for the next 30 years. So before we look at Czechoslovakia, let's just remind ourselves of the context of where we've got to. So after the Hungarian uprising of 1956, there are events in Germany and over in Cuba that bring the Cold War to a boiling point. In Brezhnev's period of rule, the Cold War had actually started to calm down. And the Prague Spring, which started events in Czechoslovakia in 1968, came in a period of relative um, calm and decreased tension between the superpowers. So let's focus on Czechoslovakia now and see what had been going on there since the Second World War. So it had been under communist rule that had been established in 1948. It had been ruled for a long time by a hardline Stalinist dictator, Antony Novotny. Now he had risen to power with Soviet backing. He was really Moscow's man in Czechoslovakia. And Novotny had established a hardline regime with the usual characteristics of a strong and very active secret police force and his policies were entirely loyal to Moscow. But this had led to problems. So Czechoslovakia had not done well economically. Its previously strong economy had been failing. It had agreed and obeyed the economic demands of being in Comic-Con and reform programs had failed. Standards of living were low. And this all put together had led to political instability. Let's look at that instability in slightly more detail now. So, as we've said, We've got Novotny as a hardline leader, as a hardline dictator, and he'd been in place since 1953. But he had risen with Moscow's support, but he lost that support. Leonid Brezhnev had actually visited Czechoslovakia and was amazed at how unpopular Novotny's regime was. And this had led Brezhnev to come to a decision that Soviet security would actually be better if Novotny was not in place. So, with Soviet support, a moderate reformer from within the Communist Party, Alexander Dubček, replaced Novotny as First Secretary in 1968. And Dubček, when he took office, began a reform programme. This was carefully monitored by Moscow. And as he went forward, Moscow became increasingly concerned about that program. So let's look at Dubček's reform program in slightly more detail and see how it eventually led to direct Soviet intervention. He started with a limited reform program. 
socialism with a human face, which tried to remove some of the excesses of Novotny's regime. So it limited the secret police force's powers, it relaxed censorship, it gave more freedom to industries to produce what they wanted to produce, and he relaxed travel uh, restrictions. So the Czechoslovakian people were more free to come and go and to leave the country. This was all carefully monitored by Brezhnev and other Soviet officials. They were concerned, but they did not intervene. Now, partly because Moscow had not intervened, Dubček went further with his programme. And some of the things that he introduced eventually went too far. We've got some of the key things here that led to direct intervention. So firstly, one party rule would come to an end. A non-communist political party was tolerated. And this put together with further relaxing of travel restrictions and economic discussions with West Germany meant that the reform program could no longer be tolerated. In Brezhnev's eyes, he had gone too far and he was now a threat to Soviet security. And so, Brezhnev mobilised other Warsaw Pact countries and a Soviet-led invasion of Czechoslovakia took place with the aim of bringing this reform program to a close by removing Dubček from power. Let's look in more detail at the events of the Soviet intervention. So it started in August of 1968 and Warsaw Pact forces entered Czechoslovakia with the aim of removing Dubček and restoring loyal, hard-line communist rule. There was some fighting and opposition, but not much. Deaths were limited to their hundreds rather than their thousands. Dubček himself was arrested, removed from office and taken to Moscow. And hardline orthodox rule was quickly re-established. Demonstrations did continue, most famously by Jan Palek, who you can see in the bottom image there. He was a Czechoslovakian student who set himself on fire in protest against the normalisation programme. Normalisation was the return to orthodox one-party hardline rule. So let's look at the consequences of the Soviet intervention, firstly for superpower relations. Relations between the superpowers temporarily worsened, but they soon repaired themselves. This is partly because America was deeply involved in the Vietnam War at this point, and there was an unspoken deal that the superpowers would be free to intervene in their own spheres of influence without the other superpower stepping in. So in the longer term, the reduction in tensions continued. Now consequences for the Soviet Union are quite definite. The Brezhnev Doctrine was established and this justified the Soviet intervention. And the doctrine stated that the Soviet Union would actively intervene if any member state of the Warsaw Pact looked like it was going to leave or was straying from the path of one-party communism. It established that the Soviet Union had the right to protect its security and would actively do this. So this tied their satellite states closely to them. This did come at some cost. There were tensions within the pact for example, Romania disapproved of the Soviet Union's actions and didn't take part, but of course weren't free to leave under the Brezhnev Doctrine. Secondly, consequences for the USA. They condemned the invasion, but did not offer any military support. This was partly because America was too distracted with its own concerns in Vietnam, and secondly, there's a presidential campaign going on. Lastly, consequences for Czechoslovakia itself. A hardline regime was quickly re-established. The normalisation programme ensured that any of Dubček's reforms were short-lived. And Czechoslovakia was subjected to hardline communist rule for the next 20 years. So let's look for some similarities between our two events.
So both events were popular reactions against repressive hardline communist regimes. And in the build up to the Soviet intervention, there had been political instability where Moscow had tried to shore up and then had removed failing regimes to try to limit the instability in those countries. There had been reform programs in both, led by modernising communists, by Imre Nagy and Alexander Dubček, and their reforms had been tolerated at first. But then when those reform programs went too far, Moscow reacted, particularly when it thought that, it, that they posed a threat to their security with issues around borders and travel restrictions, one-party communism and threats to the Warsaw Pact not being tolerated. And in both of our events, the USA protested and condemned the Soviet Union's actions but did not actively intervene. And so loyal, hardline communist regimes were quickly re-established in both countries. Now on this slide, I've just put together some of the key features. You might like to pause the presentation at this point and maybe note down some of our bullet points here. Let's see how this might be assessed. Here are some practice questions for you to have a go at. Firstly, two consequences questions. Secondly, a narrative question from the 2019 exam. And lastly, an importance question from the 2018 exam. Now we've got specific guidance on how to do these questions on other videos on our CHSG History channel. Okay, thanks for watching. There's plenty more exam advice and revision material on the CHSG History YouTube channel.